in the beginning part eight, biblical theology and the doctrine of creation. Uh, we've been going through the book in the beginning, science and scripture confirm creation. And uh, it's uh, written by, or edited I should say, by Brian Ball, though he does have two chapters as well. Um, and uh, he himself was born in Devon, England, and then got his master's in religion from Andrews and his PhD from the University of London. And he's been a church pastor, evangelist, conference president. That's the North England Conference. The principal of Avondale College, going to the opposite end of the world. And president of the South Pacific Division. And he's currently married and has three children. The book itself is written from a perspective that views scriptures as decisive. Uh, its authority takes precedence over all of the sources of information concerning origins. Uh, so then you'll have two-thirds of the book roughly about theology, evidences for the faithful <coughs> transmission of the text, arguments against higher criticism, and for a view consonant with Jesus and the New Testament. And it includes scientific chapters by Tim Standish, Grenville Kent, John Walton, James Gibson, and Ariel Roth. So there's five chapters on science, and then there's two on kind of miscellaneous things that theistic evolution <coughs> and uh, the evolutionary morality. Um, this chapter is um, bi Biblical Theology and the Doctrine of Creation. It's by Paul B. Peterson, and we're going to see part of what uh, drives him in just a little bit. Paul Peterson got his uh, P BA from uh, Copenhagen University and uh, got an MA from the same institution, apparently a, some kind of a candidate for ph uh, philosophy, I guess. I'm not sure what exactly that title is. And uh, then got his PhD from Andrews University. And uh, been a youth director in uh, Denmark, a, a junior college pastor in Denmark, and then president of the Danish Seventh-day Adventist Church, which I presume is a conference there. Bibli director of biblical research in the South Pacific Division, so he then moved out to uh, the opposite end of the world himself and went to, uh, and is now the field secretary of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in, in that particular area. Um, and uh, Peterson bring, begins his, uh, his uh, 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 section with a fairly long introduction, his uh, chapter. To the ordinary reader of the Bible, the opening account of creation leaves an overwhelming and majestic impression that it is almost impossible to continue reading any part of the biblical canon without this grand beginning in mind. Obviously, any biblically-based theology will need to incorporate the concept of creation as an essential part of its structure, certainly if you're reading it in the traditional way. Many contemporary biblical scholars recognize that Genesis is foundational to the rest of the Bible and to biblical theology itself. Andrew Reed describes Genesis as a start waiting for a finish, a beginning waiting for an end, and explains, and tells us of a creator in his plan for redemption. It sets an agenda, outlines the issues, graphically gives them human form, and proposes a solution, but never quite goes to its end. It therefore thoroughly prepares the Christian reader for Christ and enriches our understanding of his work and of God's great purpose. And that's the way it is seen, I think, by most people. I'm going to skip a paragraph. Um, and then he goes on to say, however, while the concept of creation is understood by many to be an underlying theological premise of all scriptures, specific reference to the first chapters of Genesis may seem surprisingly scarce throughout the Bible. This fact has led critical observers to various conclusions, among them that the creation accounts may be a late addition to the main body of the Hebrew Bible and or that its specific detailed content is less relevant for the theology of the biblical authors in general. While there may be general agreement that the concept of creation plays a significant role in a biblically based theology, it is after all historically understood this way, and creation found its way into all the major creeds of Christianity, 
It has become popular to downgrade the significance of the specific details of the how and when of creation for such a theology, thus creating a dualism between concept and reality. So what he's primarily aiming at is two claims. One, that the Genesis account is actually added to the canon late and presumably written late in, uh, in terms of the uh, Hebrew Bible itself. And then number two, that the details don't really matter. And I think that's a worthy goal to aim at and I, I, uh, we're going to see how well he does. In my view, such conclusions fail to grasp the important aspects of the way the authors of the Bible speak throughout about God and creation. A uh, truly biblical theology of creation cannot be separated from the reality of the acts of creating and any theology that the particulars of the biblical revelation in respect to creation. And I'm going to stop there and say that last clause I missed. I think that was something originally said something else and um, in the editing it got cut up and it never got repaired. Uh, at least I, this part here is, well I'd say Greek to me but that wouldn't be fair. In this chapter, I intend to sketch a biblical theology with an emphasis on the role of creation and will do so by taking some of the biblical references to the opening chapters of Genesis as the starting point for the major aspects of such a theology. While the approach is thus systematic, the aim in this process is also to highlight the significance of detail in the biblical creation account, seeking to throw some light on what the biblical references to Genesis 1 and 2 imply theologically regarding the realistic or factual nature of the creation account. So, he has now set himself uh, the job to do, uh, and now he's going to outline very briefly the areas that he's going to concentrate on. Space limitations prevent a fully developed systematic theology, so this study will cover only five essential aspects of biblical theology. The nature of God is transcendent, God is imminent, anthropology, history, and eschatology, the last two elements to be considered together. Now, he's uh, point one of uh, his four major areas. <coughs> Defining God as transcendent. And it's interesting that although he talks about transcendence, he also talks about imminence in this first paragraph. The creation account in the first two chapters of Genesis presents two aspects of the nature and being of God for which theologians often use the term transcendent and imminent. On the one hand, God is, as in Genesis 1, the distant, transcendent, totally other being who by his word speaks the world into existence. On the other hand, God is, in the second part of the creation account from 2.4b to 25, described as the God who comes close to his creation who is imminent, who, with us, who forms humans from the soil of the earth and who kisses Adam into existence by blowing his spirit into his nostrils. Later biblical references to creation frequently underline the transcendence of God and as can clearly be seen, for example, in the book of Acts. At two strategically and theologically significant points, Acts, by quoting the fourth commandment, describe God as the one, quote, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, end quote. The, uh, and there are the references, Acts 4 and Acts 14. The two occasions are a prayer and a sermon, and both prayer and preaching figure significantly in the record of Acts. The first event is a prayer in connection with the only recorded New Testament early church worship service. Acts 4, 24 to 30. And the second reference is found in the first recorded apostolic sermon in Acts preached to a non-Jewish Gentile audience, namely Paul's speech in Lystra. Uh, 
the phrase used in Acts is not a reference to the opening line of Genesis 1-1, which is merism, heaven and earth, you may remember. Um, a literary device where two opposites are employed to express totality, you know, from the east to the west, and implying everything in between. Rather, Acts directly quotes from the fourth commandment in Exodus 20, 11, which explicitly expresses belief in the literal creation week. The repetition of the quotation in the Sermon at Lystra underlines the continuity of the core Christian message when moving from Jewish to the Gentile context, saying it, it applies to everybody, and it makes it also universal. Going back to creation means that you're not going back to the Jews or even to Abraham, you're going all the way back to the ancestor of everyone. The traditional Greek and Roman view, culture viewed the world as eternal and God's as being with a definite beginning. In comparison, the concept of a God as totally independent and self-existent being who created the world out of nothing was unique to the Hebrew heritage of the Christian church. From a broader historical and systematic theological perspective, this understanding has been, and still is, a contrast to the number of isms of the past and present, including paganism in general, materialism, humanism, and secularism. So he's kind of coming out not only arguing about what it meant then, but also, in a certain sense, what it means now. Psalm 33, 6 to 9, John is the 1, 1 to 3, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 to 6, and Colossians 1, 15 through 17 are all passages that he refers to and comments on. He goes on to say, not the least is the 1 Corinthians passage relevant in this context. And uh, for those of you who don't remember, the, uh, the 1 Corinthians passage starts out by saying, a meat offered to idols, now we know that there are many gods, but for us there's only one God and one Lord. Remember that? And that's the passage he's talking about. So it's fundamental to his discussion of the whole meat offered to idols section that uh, we get our theology straight, and our theology happens to line up with the Genesis account. Be, uh, not the least is the First Corinthians passage relevant in this context because it contrasts the God of the Old Testament with the pagan gods of Greek and Roman pantheon, gods which have no real existence. The biblical God, however, is the creator of everything. As such, being a being independent of all matter, eternal, omnipotent, and omniscient, God cannot be absolutely identified with any specific place on earth, including the sanctuary. And then he mentions Acts uh, 7, 44 and 48 through 49. This is Stephen's speech, you may remember. The conflict was not simply about the right to worship God everywhere. In a broad sense, Jews already did that, the synagogues. Rather, the issue centered on the sacrificial aspect of the temple worship that Stephen, just like Christ shortly before, is accused of aiming to set aside. Stephen justifies his position by bringing the required two or three witnesses, reference to Deuteronomy 19.15. They are the best possible, Moses, Solomon, and Isaiah. That is, the law, the writings, and the prophets. He refers first to the inauguration of the tabernacle in the time of Moses. And um, in Acts 7, uh, 44 to 45, and compare Exodus 25, 40. And next, to the establishment of the temple service in the time of Solomon. This by way of the prophet Isaiah. Um, and there are the references there. Who himself quotes the inaugural prayer of Solomon in 1 Kings 8, 27 to 28. In their original context in Exodus and 1 Kings, both these texts underline that the earthly sanctuary is but a shadow of the heavenly reality. Remember, the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built. Stephen thus points to heaven with its archetypal, 
archetypal, uh, archetypal, I guess, sanctuary, now inaugurated by Christ through his sacrifice on Calvary as the only true holy place. His final words directed to the Sanhedrin is the last straw, cementing their rage as he sees heaven opened and Jesus at God's right hand and testifies to Christ's exaltation as heavenly high priest. Acts 7, 56. From now on, there is only one truly holy place, and it is not on earth. This theological perspective also quickly brought the early church on a collision course with the Hellenistic pagan world that the first Christians encountered. As it does still today, when the church faces various other religions or movements like the New Age for which specific places on earth may be power centers or holy in themselves. God's independence of the created world, his ex nihilo creation from a transcendent status beyond that which is earthly and creaturely, implies that no earthly space is holy in itself. It also implies that this transcendent God can only be known through his self-revelation. That process discloses that, instead of a holy place, he has chosen to set aside holy time, a palace in time, the weekly Sabbath, as the locus of worship. But this symbol, the Sabbath, only carries a significance by its specific nature it is by meeting humans on a specific particular day that God is worshipped as the creator God who is known only by his self-revelation. This concept of revelation is all essential for the divine human dialogue. God is first known by his specific concrete intervention. History comes before philosophy. You might say history is the evidence upon which philosophy is built, uh, which is fascinating because there is a movement on, uh, that, uh, that says the philosophy came first and then the history uh, gets corrected to the philosophy and that is precisely what we see in the uh, higher critical method. And uh, in fact, uh, you can trace that back through uh, Wellhausen, through Graf, uh, through Fatke, and eventually through Hegel. In prayer, specific thanksgiving leads to general praise. In praise, we worship God for what he always is, but we have come to realize and believe that he is so because in specific history, he has shown himself to be what he is. So the worship of God on the specific time of the Sabbath day underlines the historical revelation and the intervention by God and presumes, uh, presupposes by its specific nature the creation account in Genesis. Then he switches to revealing God as imminent. While underlining the transcendence of God, biblical references to creation also point to his imminence, his closeness to created humanity. One of the clearest illustrations of this is found in Paul's epistle to the Romans. It is evident that Paul believed enough in gen the Genesis account to make it clear that Adam and sin were both real and that death entered the world as a result of Adam's sin. There is little room for long time epics with death existing before sin. He quotes R.C.H. Lenski, there is not a we in the whole paragraph. All is objective, all is historical. That's the paragraph of Romans 5. So Paul is using this as a, a description of objective reality. It's not reality as we experience it. It is not a postmodern reality. The incarnation is the indispensable cornerstone of Christian theology, in very essence affirming God's imminence. God with us, in the words of the angelic pro proclamation at the birth of Christ. In Christ, God has become a human being, now generally, genuinely known to us as a person. He revealed himself. So Paul's very specific belief in the historicity of Adam and the fall is to him part of the divine drama of salvation, the story of redemption, basic and inseparable elements of which are creation, the fall, and Calvary. And if Calvary is a real event, then creation 
and the fall are considered to be real events. You don't have to believe the Apostle Paul, but that's what he stood for. Anthropology and lifestyle. From a theological standpoint, anthropology refers to the biblical understanding of the humankind and human nature, and therefore consequently to the manner in which humans are to live their lives in the sight of a transcendent and imminent God. Human nature. In a dialogue with the Pharisees recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus quotes the Genesis account as an authority in regard to the proper understanding of marriage. Matthew 9, 4 through 6. The reference to Genesis 2.24 is unambiguous, the confidence of Jesus and the Gospel writer in its veracity, unquestionable. It makes little sense, therefore, to advise people to live their lives in uh, their practical family lives in accordance with and on the basis of Genesis 1 and 2 if human sexuality was not created but evolved. Since actually human nature in that case would differ dramatically from that set forth in the first chapters of the Bible and assumed and confirmed by the words of Jesus in Matthew 19. Human existence is concrete, it is specific, it is also always physical. It is by acknowledging this eternal creator God who is outside of me that I as a human reach and maintain any genuine humanity. The Bible underscores that whenever humans in their ambition to live forever take upon themselves the role of God, yielding to the snake-like temptation to be like God, Genesis 3, 5, they stop being human and may even become more bestial than human. And he gives the example of Nebuchadnezzar. Similarly, ho human holiness does not consist in becoming divine but in being sanctified to and by the one who alone is holy in himself. That, of course, is a uh, direct uh, attack on the on New Age uh, belief. Jesus also acknowledges the reality of the fall. In this passage in uh, Matthew 19, uh, where he says, Moses gave you these instructions for the hardness of your heart. We no longer live in the originally perfect world. Law, this is another supporting evidence, law and wisdom bringing order to the world. Law and wisdom are two major types of text in the Old Testament that advise humans on how to organize their lives in a broken world. The clear framework for both is the concept of divine creation. Creation is thus mentioned explicitly in many places in hymnic and wisdom literature, such as in Ecclesiastes 12.1 and following, Psalms 8, 19, Psalm 19, Job 38 through 40, and in Psalms 33, 6 through 9, which contains a clear and strong emphasis on creation out of nothing but the word. A closer reading of some of these texts has revealed how the specifics of the creation account in Genesis form the background for the theological message they contain. Jacques Ducan has, for instance, developed a, a detected a literary use of the sequence of the seventh day creation week in Job 38 through 40. And uh, he discusses Psalm 19, which has creation in the law, followed by the events of the uh, event of the fall, and then the great sin of verse uh, 13b, the presumptuous sin. Creation in the legal body of the Pentateuch is, he likens to tithing. Similarly, he says, the significance of the sacrificial system has to be understood on the basis of major narratives in Genesis. On the one hand, the creation fall accounts and the subsequent sacrifices. Um, compare Genesis 4, 1 through 7. On the other hand, the Akedah, um, the, st the story of Abraham's journey to Mount Moriah to sacrifice his only son Isaac in Genesis 22. These events lend theological meaning to the notion of sacrifice and the ceremonial system presented at times is somewhat technical terminology from Exodus to Deuteronomy is to be read and understood against that background. So what he's saying is that the Pentateuch does in fact have a background of creation behind it 
even though it isn't totally explicit. Julia Muscala has convincingly shown how the laws regarding clean and unclean foods in Leviticus are closely structured with a view to the creation account in Genesis. A lot of parallels there. So Leviticus seems to be written in a context that uh, knows the six-day story of creation. This practical ordering of human life is presented in both law and wisdom writings within the framework of creation with the implicit references also to the account in Genesis. Such ordering also presupposes by its very nature the veracity of details in the creation account. To follow practical advice for the daily living out of our existence as created beings, such as diet, makes little sense if the specifics of that act of creation never took place. And then he comes to his final um, section, history, creating hope in chaos. The divine purpose as revealed in, revealed in the original act of creation has not yet been fully realized. Yet God's original intention strengthens our hope in the midst of a chaotic world. In the book of Revelation, the most significant theme may be the motif of the restored and regained paradise. Revelation 22.2 contains an explicit reference to the tree of life from the Garden of Paradise of Eden, or Garden or Paradise of Eden. In the literary context of the book, this reference is best understood by the emphasis it gives to the concept of creation. Jesus is presented to the last of the seven churches as the origin or ruler of creation, Revelation 3.14 NIV. Uh, the, the Greek word is arche. Uh, which sounds like beginning, um, but origin is probably a good translation of that. Um, and I find it fascinating that uh, that's the message to the very last church, is that they need to know that Jesus is the origin of, uh, or the ruler of creation. The message to be proclaimed to the world before the second coming of Jesus contains a strong appeal to worship the Creator, Revelation 10, 6 and 7, and uh, it, that quotes the, uh, ten command, uh, the fourth commandment again, although in a, uh, excuse me, um, in a uh, uh, an expanded version. And then Revelation 14, 6 through 7, which uh, also quotes although more directly, uh, the fourth commandment. And when the battle is over, God's voice is heard, proclaiming with specific reference to the old, marred creation, behold, I am making all things new. Interestingly enough, again, doing it with his word. The hope, the th pardon me, the thought that ha human hope for the future is based on God's power to totally recreate the world and establish a new order is of course not unique to the apocalyptic literature of the Bible. For example, the prophet Isaiah also spoke about the future messianic kingdom. Only the omnipotent God, independent of all creation, is able to create a reality where the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and he finishes that whole section, which is a long section on all the things that are going to happen that, that uh, wouldn't happen ordinarily in our world. Um, in Isaiah's 11, 6 through 7. And then he mentions Isaiah 45, 18 through 19, which uh, some of us may remember uh, this is the God that stretches out the heavens and spreads out the earth, uh, rakah, the, the word that uh, is supposed to mean beating, beaten out, but doesn't always. Psalms 46, the sea are in uproar or rage, using the word and so are the nations. The mountains totter, using the word moat, and so do the kingdoms. Um, so you have the creation and the kingdoms uh, behaving very similarly in Psalm 46. Laws are given before the events they are to commemorate take place. And he gives the example Passover and the tabernacle. 
where the instructions for building it are given before it's built. Uh, and interestingly, Moses is punished for using his rod, not the word, the power of which would have shown the holiness of God. There was, Moses was being asked to behave like the creator. And he went back to using physical objects. Here, as in the original creation, the word precedes the reality. The word of God thus guarantees the reality of the future to come. If he says it, it will happen. Creation becomes the theological basis for restoration and recreation. Thus, the Genesis scholar Derek Kidner can perceptively say that Genesis is, in various ways, almost nearer to the New Testament than the Old, and some of its topics are barely heard again till their implications can fully emerge in the Gospel. He then concludes, finally, there is the symmetry by which some of the very scenes and figures of the earliest chapters reappear in the book of Revelation, where Babel, or Babylon, and that ancient serpent, the deceiver of the whole world, come to their downfall. And the redeemed, though now veterans rather than untried innocents, walk again in paradise by the river and the tree of life. Hope and eschatology come together at the end and they do so in no small measure on the basis of the details in the Genesis creation account. His summary reflections. <clears throat> in this brief chapter, I have made an attempt to sketch the contours of a biblical theology grounded in the Genesis creation account and with specific reference to the details of that account. And I'm going to skip the next uh, uh, paragraph that the creation motive is essential to any Christian and biblically based theology is therefore uncontested. To what degree and in what ways such a theology presupposes and demands the veracity of the details of the Genesis creation is not uncontested. Two reflections help answer that question. First, I find realism inherent in the very concept of creation. To keep creation on an abstract level of thought is simply contrary to the very idea. By nature, cre creation implies reality. It is certainly true that the biblical description in Genesis is neither naturalistic nor intended to answer our present culture's specific questions arising from science and knowledge. Yet, it is quite evident that the readers of the original text would have understood the account as describing what was believed to have actually happened. Today's apparent problem was not their problem. And I would certainly agree with that. My second major reflection regarding the ex nihilo concept of creation, but it must also be pointed out that the very concept of creation out of nothing implies that we move beyond mere history. In one sense, there are no historical accounts of creation. No humans were present. If the biblical material, if the biblical account of Genesis in Genesis is seen simply as historical material, we will come to assess its qualities and analyze its style and content exclusively from a comparative angle. In that case, we will have begun treating it like the text from any other book, and we will by our very method have excluded the concept of God, which the Bible itself presupposes, namely the creator God who can be known only through his self-revelation. Genesis 2 was experienced by Adam. Genesis 1 was God's story. There is little doubt, as it is generally accepted by all Bible scholars, conservatives among them, that the Genesis account was written in a cultural context. It is polemical. It addresses issues of relevance for its time. It reflects thorough acquaintance with Mesopotamian and Egyptian culture and mythology. In short, it is evidently culturally directed. But it is relevant in its culture exactly because it is a divine revelation to that culture. This revelation speaks in the cultural language of its day and enjoys, employs genres and stylistic features that the reader of the day was able to comprehend. 
Any analysis of the biblical text will have to take that into consideration. Yet, as divine revelation, it speaks truthfully and with an authority far beyond the limitations of the prevailing culture, because its ultimate source is the Creator God, who is independent of culture, but able, willing, and wanting to reveal himself to all cultures. In short, if the creation account in Genesis 1-2 is to give any meaning within the context of a biblical theology, it has to be viewed as part of the revelation from God. Humans have no way of knowing what happened at creation except through revelation. Only God can make it known. Within the framework of a biblical theology, we confess that he has done so. We have seen that throughout the Bible, we consistently find testimonies that underscore the significance also of the specifics of creation. The creation account of Genesis 1 to 2 contains particulars that are practical and relevant for both our worship of God and our personal identity and corporate existence, such as the Sabbath, lifestyle, family, and sexuality. The biblical references to these aspects of life must also be understood as part of the divine revelation. This biblical witness is God's way of communicating what he wants us to know. Now, my take on all this, that's the end of the chapter, is that I mostly agree with Dr. Peterson. The only place that I would uh, disagree with him is the polemics. And the reason why I would do that is because I, I think that that, uh, that the first account is actually a, uh, a good account that was not written deliberately with polemics in mind uh, to start with. Um, or perhaps was written so well with polemics in mind that, it, that, it, uh, uh, that they were incorporated in such a way that uh, uh, they didn't have to be stated. And the reason why I say that is because the story, of course, can be read as a polemic against the, uh, uh, the uh, competing theologies of the day. But I think the story can also be read as a polemic against uh, the modern scientific synthesis. And I don't think anybody is arguing that when it was written, it was written with that synthesis in mind except, of course, as God, knowing the future, would prepare uh, it for that. So that, uh, that's one place where I think we have to be a little bit careful as uh, is putting the polemics into it as, a, uh, as something the writer did. Um, the book itself has a defense of the uh, scriptural story of Genesis, and this is where he fits in. There's, uh, there's such a thing as propositional revelation. The text is reliable. The word speaks for itself. Genesis is theologically sound. There's two chapters on that. Genesis is ancient, gives the tablet theory. Genesis describes a recent creation. That's the one we did last week. Um, creation and biblical theology are mutually supportive. Um, And this one, if it had been honed in a little bit more, it might have uh, plugged a hole that needed to be plugged. The New Testament supports the Genesis creation. The creation is more compatible with Jesus than evolution, and then there are scientific uh, chapters and the ethics and theistic evolution chapters. Um, I, I think that the chapter addresses both the Old and New Testament uses of the creation account, and um, only the former really addresses the, the, at least one of the questions that he's asked in the beginning, that is the, about the account being a late addition. Because I think everybody acknowledges that Genesis was written before the New Testament and uh, hundreds of years before the New Testament. So uh, that's, there's really no reason to argue about that, I don't think. The New Testament references will be covered in the next chapter and it would seem to me that it would have been helpful to have uh, perhaps uh, um, honed in on the Old Testament material. Um, 
that also give him more, t more space to deal with the, the problems at hand. And frankly, there aren't a lot of, um, of uh, uh, essays that uh, deal with the question of how do you defend Genesis at the beginning of the Old Testament instead of putting it as a late addition at the end. Um, I think uh, Peterson also addresses theological questions that other people address. And uh, it seems to me that, uh, that sometimes it would be nice to have less repetition and more concentration on the areas of your unique, uh, that you're uniquely trying to address. In my opinion, he would probably have been better off to have concentrated on the Old Testament references. And uh, then he could have taken more space to deal with them. But having said that, I think that's a, a, uh, not a criticism that uh, makes the chapter uh, worthless. I think it is still a worthwhile chapter. I just think it could have been um, perhaps a little more worthwhile if uh, he had dealt with that one question in particular that really doesn't get dealt with very often. Uh, and with that, uh, I will... Uh, open the floor to comments and questions. Um, pardon me for not being up to date, perhaps, but uh, could you elicit, uh, elaborate a little bit on the, the uh, timing of Genesis creation story, the writer, and why there's a difference of opinion there. Well, um, if you go to graduate school, one of the things they're going to teach you is that the standard theory is that Genesis was um, written fairly late, particularly Genesis 1. What graduate school? Pick a graduate school, Harvard, Yale, Stanford. Uh, uh, Theological graduate school. Yeah. Uh, and, and in fact, for most liberal Christian, I mean, what you have to realize, of course, is that Harvard was once upon a time a Christian university, as was Yale. Um, there are very few, very few schools, I think Cornell being one of them, that were actually started with the intention of being um, uh, not trying to turn out Christians at the end. And over time, there's been drift of the, uh, of the focus of the university. Um, that's not an unusual thing to have happen. We've had a few universities of our own that have had some of that drift on occasion. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, you know, you go to any graduate school, I mean, uh, not just in the United States, in Europe, you know, if you go to the University of London, which uh, one of them went to, a couple of the authors went to, actually. Uh, if you go to Tübingen, you go to Bern, you go to Oxford, you'll all get the same story. The documentary hypothesis is kind of the standard from which people start. And the documentary hypothesis puts the, the creation story of Genesis 1 late. Uh, originally it was post-exilic, now people are getting cold feet over that, maybe it's really in the time of Hezekiah or something like that. Um, but it's quite late. In, in, and that's the, one of the reasons they give for that is that you have this wonderful story and then nobody talks about it all throughout the earlier material. And uh, I think it would be worthwhile uh, defending the biblical story as one which is in, uh, woven through implicitly the material that we have in the Old Testament. To be able to show, uh, I think that, for example, although he doesn't mention it here, the sanctuary that images the creation story is in fact an evidence that the Genesis story percolates through Exodus. Uh, 
uh, and insofar as the sanctuary uh, goes through kings and Solomon, uh, that you have evidence that Solomon looked uh, uh, back, perhaps through some mist, but certainly back to the Genesis story. And, and the idea is that I think it's critical for, for us to show that in fact the Genesis story does form an underlying reality with which the other books react, even though they don't mention it all the time in every page, refer, referring back to it, that in fact, for example, the book of Proverbs starts out by wisdom and that God created, and when he was created there, I was at his right hand. And there's a whole, I don't know, four or five chapters there that, uh, where wisdom is referred to in very much the same way as the word is talked about in John. Um, uh, in fact, there's, there's a several uh, points that I think he didn't mention that uh, probably could have been mentioned. And I think that to concentrate on that and to, sh because we're going to have somebody next week that's going to talk about the New Testament. Um, I'd like to see somebody deal with the Old Testament and its dependence on creation. Well, the reason I ask the question is because you know, if, you, if you love to read the Psalms. Uh, the, the reason I ask the question is that one of the, my favorite books in, in, in the Bible is the Psalms. It's filled with creation. Yes. What, have these guys not read that? Or do they uh, not believe David existed? Where does all that stuff come from? Well, I, I think this is the point, that in order to do that, what you have to do is refuse to acknowledge anything beyond what's absolutely verbally stated. And you see, that way you can say, well, it was creation, but it wasn't six days. And it could have been creation by anything. And that allows people to say, well, maybe it was creation by evolution. God set up a process, and he allowed it to run. And that gets into both systematic theology is uh, theistic evolution, a proper way of looking at things. And it also uh, gets into the specifics of the biblical record and the specifics of the seventh day. Um, I'm a little concerned by the way it's argued sometimes. Because what will happen is you find two or three references here and there that will say, oh yeah, it's like the law. The law is this wonderful thing, and then you read it in Joshua, and it refers to the law, and then you get to Judges, and the law just kind of disappears. Um, and you see very little explicit reference to the law of Moses until you get to Chronicles, which is supposed to be written late. Um, but on the way through, you see also Occasionally things where it says they, uh, they put Joash to death, but they didn't put his sons to death because, um, because of the law in, in Deuteronomy. And people say, well, that wasn't really real. Well, it's like, you know, all the evidence is on my side except for that, and, and we'll just ignore that. And <laughs> to, to my mind, that's not really playing fair. Um, but it is the way these people deal with it. They, you know, it's, I mentioned the, that, um, that they bend history to fit their paradigm. And that's, that's actually what's happening, is that, is that the history doesn't come first. The paradigm actually comes first. The history is molded to fit the paradigm. And if there are little twigs out here that, that would get him into trouble, they just are conveniently chopped off. Uh, and, you know, you can make it almost fit, so, yeah, let's just take the rest of it. I, it's being done. It's not fair. I think that that unfairness should be pointed out. And I think that a chapter that did that thoroughly with the Old Testament 
would be more useful in this context than what he's done. Um, and, and I think that uh, that's the reason why I, I say I think this actually could have been more useful than it was. It's, it's useful. He kind of does half of a job. I just, uh, he does half a job here and half a job that other people are doing. I just wish he'd done the whole job. I don't know. Maybe he'll watch the video sometime. <laughs> I, I would just uh, <clears throat> say I don't know how, what his assignment was and how the book was organized. <clears throat> I'm very impressed with the chapter. I, I think he, 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 he I mean, uh, his thinking is clear, and I think he's uh, selected, uh, I might say, uh, the, these important uh, themes that affirm the consistency of the Bible. And I really like, I really like this chapter uh, because of that. It's, it's an excellent resource. Uh, true, he may have covered more than the Old Testament. Uh, that's fine. It's a good resource. Yeah, it may not have been <coughs> his. Uh, in fact, he may have taken this on on himself uh, while being assigned to do a more general <coughs> article, in which case you can hardly blame him for doing it. Exactly. It's actually the editors in that case. We need to keep, yeah, this, this could have been a, uh, and maybe, uh, I mean, it's not always easy to get authors for these things, you know, and so on. He, an editor also has problems. He takes what he can get. Yeah. A uh, comment up here. Mm, uh, I wonder if you uh, could comment a little more about this uh, documentary hypothesis, which which I'm not that well familiar with. Uh, and the reason why, why well, I, I'm not in that field. Uh, but the, the question that really puzzles me and that, that intrigues me is, what is the driving force behind the need to drive the explanatory how should I say, f direction, uh, the way it's going. Why not just take it just the way it is? What, what, what is the, the desperate need to keep chopping off things that don't fit the preset? Uh, what's the preset dogma that, that needs to be accommodated? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled. Usually when people have, have such a, a intense drive for something, it's because they have a very strong reason for it. So what's that strong reason for doing all that? Um, before I answer that question, I should point out that it's uh, now 11.30 and I know some people have to be elsewhere. Um, but uh, maybe I can say that it, there, is a, there was a concatenation of three different driving forces that uh, came together to create the uh, documentary hypothesis in the, hypothesis in the first place. Um, one of them was uh, that people started becoming aware of the fact that documents could have sources and started looking at them in more detail. And this kind of thing actually was first noted by a Christian who stayed a Christian and didn't have any particular reasons. Um, uh, Jean Astrick, um, who recognized that there were uh, sources and he said, well, Moses used sources. And that has kind of matured into the documentary hypothesis that we heard what, three, three weeks ago or so, um, the, the tablet theory. 
Uh, if you look at Genesis 1, it uses a particular style. And the style runs all the way through chapter 2, verse 4, uh, ending with these are the generations of the heavens and the earth, or this is the story of the heavens and the earth, probably is a better way of translating that. And then Genesis 2 has an entirely different style. Not just different content, not just different focus, but actually different style. In Genesis 1, it's always God, Elohim. Bereshith bara Elohim, Hashemayim v'ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it's always God. And, and if you read it in the English translations, it'll, it'll use the word God to translate it all the way through. Now, when you get down to Genesis 2, it always says Yahweh Elohim. Or if you're a good uh, Jew, you read it as Adonai Elohim, but um, because they wouldn't pronounce the, the name of God. Um, but in that case, you're talking about an entirely different way of referring to God. Um, and Ostrich looked at this and looked at the stylistic characteristics and said Genesis 1 was written by a different author from Genesis 2. And it's, uh, you know, if you're conservative, you say, oh yeah, God authored uh, Genesis 1 because he was there. Adam authored Genesis 2 because he was there. Okay? No problem. And then Adam authored Genesis 3, told the story of the fall, told the story of Cain and Abel, and then got down to, uh, um, you know, where he lived for 930 years and seen everything and then died. And then at that point, somebody else takes up the tale. Um, but... There were a couple of other things that came out at about the same time. One of them was that um, it was discovered that a number of things that were just assumed to be accurate documents turned out not to be so. That, for example, there were references to things that wouldn't have been true way back when the original document was made, but would be known by the people let's say, five centuries later. The, uh, uh, there, uh, I think that the Isidore and the Creedles were discovered to be a fraud. Um, and that was the church of that day that basically made up stuff in order to fit. And so, number one, ancient documents that gave somebody privilege were immediately put under suspicion, and particularly ancient documents that gave the church privilege were put under suspicion. The Bible is one of those. Um, and so the Bible came in for flack because of what the church had done earlier, or I should say later. Um, and so they said, well, you can't trust the church. Well, you can't trust the church here either, which is, mm, kind of quasi-fair, I guess you'd have to say, and it's one of the reasons why we should never lie in support of what we believe, because um, we give the enemies of God a chance to triumph, as uh, David was told. That one's kind of a neutral point. And then finally, there was a move afoot to say Christianity has wonderful ethical teachings. But you can't believe that miracle stuff. And the reason you can't believe it is because our philosophy really doesn't allow it, number one. And number two, we've never experienced it. None of us have walked through a sea which parted for us. Um, and so really what happened is that people started saying, well, you know, the laws of nature are really laws and even God doesn't break them. And depending on who you were, you said either God doesn't break them or if you prefer uh, God in chains, God can't break them. 
And so there was, outside of Christianity, this was used as a cudgel against Christianity in general, inside of Christianity there were people who were feeling very defensive about this, and so they tried to create a Christianity that didn't have miracles. Now how you do that with the resurrection, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that people should have seen this and seen that the end game was a resurrection and it didn't work. But there were people who thought that, well, if we just take away the miracles, we can have Christianity that will be acceptable to these people. And so they tried very hard to do that. And you can see that history going through in New Testament studies, um, going through Schnurmacher, going through um, Strauss, uh, eventually getting into um, uh, Albert Schweitzer. And, um, uh, and you can see it happening in Old Testament studies, and that's really what the documentary hypothesis was all about, was to try to explain the Old Testament without having to have miracles. And I can read you a quote where somebody says, yes, see, this, this is really great stuff. It doesn't require these interventions by God, these unaccountable, non-natural stuff that's happening. And so it was a way of trying to preserve the religion, the, the morality, without having the fundamental underpinnings of it there. I, I think one of the things that, that our author here, uh, Dr. Peterson, is pointing out is that history comes first Theology comes afterwards. And we know God is the kind of God he is because of the way he acts. If you please, he is arguing for an empirical religion, um, which is kind of what I, why I wrote the book Scientific Theology, is because I was arguing for you know, an evidence-based uh, where we hold our theories only as heavily as the evidence behind them is. That uh, theology ought to be done that way. Um, and uh, what these people are doing is actually precisely the reverse. They're saying we know what history is like because of our philosophy. And therefore, we're going to fit the biblical historical evidence into that by re-explaining and by trimming where necessary. And at first, they thought they could do it by looking at the old text. And that's what textual criticism was. Well, you know, 1 John 5, 7 doesn't really belong in the Bible. Well, maybe all these other ones that, are, that talk about uh, Jesus' divinity and such could be just kind of carved out. Well, it didn't work out. So then they had to go to higher criticism, which is going back to, well, you can't believe the original manuscripts even. I mean, yeah, they're pretty good. They have kernel of truth, but they got all this miraculous dross that needs to be refined out. Um, it was part of the spirit of the age, though. And these are the same people that said that you can't believe Homer because what he said about Troy, there's no town of Troy like that. This is a bunch of baloney. And of course, now we've discovered Troy and found out that, in fact, there was a town, and it was at the same time as uh, we're talking about. And... Uh, the kernel of truth has suddenly gotten much bigger than what people thought it was at one time. And I think that it's probably fair to say that archaeology did the same thing to the Bible. I don't know that it's completely resurrected it. Uh, uh, it's certainly allowed for uh, stuff to happen. Um, and uh, the credibility of the Bible is much higher than it was in, in these people's eyes a hundred years ago. A lot of the discoveries that were made suddenly, um, and you can see that in 1804 this book called Das Buch Daniel, um, 
where people did the same thing to Daniel. And they carved it into little tiny pieces. And then they found out, no, there's actually much bigger pieces. And now it's being felt that the book was probably written all at one time, still at 168 BC, um, because it's just too accurate and nobody can predict the future that well. Um, you see, once your principle is that there are no miracles, then it limits the way you deal with these things. And so you, you are forced into some kind of way of chopping up the Old Testament into pieces here and there. And it helped that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are written from two different perspectives. Now, I think they're complementary, but you see, if your mindset is that you don't try to harmonize, that in fact where you find differences, you push them hard, you exaggerate them if necessary, so that you have two contradictory stories instead of two complementary ones, then, um, then you wind up with um, two stories that, are, that don't fit each other. Well, it's no surprise because that's where you started from. Um, and um, I think a, a Pussy put it well, they, that unbelief was the starting post, not the winning, or starting point, not the winning post of their. Um, and I want to be careful because we, we can be too caustic to these people because most of them were not unbelievers in the sense of they think that um, there is no right and wrong and they're, you know, we can do what we please. And they were not card-carrying atheists. Most of them were actually people who believed that there was a God and that he was fair and so forth, but that he also, because he's fair, he has to abide by the laws that he set up. And uh, so they, God was kind of pinned in and really couldn't do the kinds of things that are described in the Bible. Um, and so it's not unbelief in the in the militant sense so much as it is unbelief in certain parts that gradually ate out the other parts. And that's the end of that kind of thing is that you know you wind up not having confidence in the Bible at all. And Julius Wellhausen is known to have said that at the end of his life. I don't know if that answers the question that you were trying to ask. Thank you so much. I, I'm not familiar with that field at all, and so this is very illuminating to, to see the kinds of um, movements that have uh, passed through that field in the past. Yeah. We have a question in the back here. Uh, along the same line, because you talked about this a week or two weeks ago, the, what was the name of the rabbi who wrote a series of works that that sort of reacted against the documentary hypothesis. Uh, Umberto Casuto. Okay, because he, at, at least when I went and looked up the Wikipedia page, it, it makes it sound at least that it was at least partially su uh, successful in being accepted, at least among some sectors, as, as, as counteracting the documentary hypothesis. I think he is one of the major reasons why um, the post-exilic part of the documentary hypothesis has gotten really shaky. And um, the P, the Priestly Code, is now considered to be before D, Deuteronomy, which means that now at least the chronology, although the absolute chronology is markedly different, the relative chronology is now the same. And I think that that's a step up. Uh, if you read who, who wrote the Bible, it's, it's interesting just to read it, but it's probably even more interesting to read it after you have learned what the standard documentary hypothesis is, because basically uh, 
he shreds pieces of it. Um, they still have documents. I have documents. I think God wrote Genesis 1. I think Adam wrote Genesis 2. And that's why they're different in style. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, I think that, for example, I think that it's a mistake to think that Genesis 1 is polemic. It's just simply truth-telling, and truth-telling happens to be polemic in some circles. It could part of it also be that because he was a rabbi, he was coming from a Jewish perspective, and the Jewish perspective did not, that was not where the documentary hypothesis arose. It did not arise from within the Jew, uh, Jewish uh, area of a study. It arose from within Christianity. Um, I, well, you'll find plenty of Reformed Jews who buy the documentary hypothesis. Um, so I'm not sure that I would put, I would put it into that. Uh, it's probably fair to say he was in a conservative Jewish and he was very well versed in the scriptures and he was not willing to bend the scriptures in order to make it fit. And basically what he says is if you take that hypothesis, you have to bend it here, you have to bend it there, you have to bend it there, suddenly, you know what, it really isn't fitting. It's like you can take a round peg and pound it in a square hole if you hide, you know, and you'll have pieces coming off. And if you're willing to allow those pieces, that's fine. But he wasn't. And I think that it's probably fair for us not to be willing to do that either. And if that's the case, then I'm sorry, it just doesn't fit. Um, question. You mentioned that uh, Genesis 1 is considered by some to be polemic. Um, the question in my mind is, what on earth are they talking about? And second, even if I was to assume that it was polemic, why does that make it less true? Well, uh, the idea of the polemic of, of, of Genesis 1 is uh, God creates light, and then he creates the great lights and the lesser light. And, by the way, the stars. Um, and for people who worship the great light as Shemesh. You ever heard of Beth Shemesh? That's the house of the sun in Hebrew. Beth, his house. Shemesh, his son. And it'd be variously pronounced depending on which dialect you happen to be in, Shemesh, Shamash. Um, but it doesn't say Shamash. It says the greater light. And it says the lesser light. It doesn't say sin or what they would call the moon. Um, and the very non-mentioning of the names of just turning, calling them lights was felt by many people to be a, an indirect put down of the deification of those lights because they don't even have a name. Hmm. Now, I think that God may have started out by simply saying, you know what, I'll just tell it the way it is and that he didn't bother to use the name uh, and knew all along that it would be a problem later on, and he'd say, see, now this is a creation account, and, and we don't even call them anything. And I think that God may have very well put it out knowing that today's evolutionary development requires long ages. And so he said six days, and the first day, and the second day, and the third day, and the fourth day, and it was evening, and it was morning, uh, that he put those in there knowing that in our day and age that would be a big controversial point. 
So it's polemic today, but not because somebody in the 20th century decided, or the 19th or the 18th century decided to write it out as an anti-evolutionary screed. It's because God built it in, with, and that was part of the stuff, it, you know. I mean, even if you don't accept Moses, you still have to accept that it's, you know, 450 BC or earlier. Uh, even if you're going to go extreme um, uh, higher critic on it. There's no way it was produced in the standard order of events as a polemic against evolutionary theory. But it is. There's two possibilities. One of them is that truth is polemic by its very nature because error wants to be polemic. The second one is that God foreknew what kind of problems we'd have and he put them into the book and tried to make it as clear as possible that he's not talking about ages of millions of years. And that he knew what he was doing and then wrote it that way anyway. And that's why I'm a little cautious about saying, well, it's polemic. You know, there's no place in there that says, and those Babylonians have got it all wrong. It just tells the story and that's the way it is and he doesn't argue the point. So it seems to me that it's easier to say that one, God knew what he was doing and two, that, that the only defense you really need is truth itself because truth refutes error simply by being there. It just, you know, I think defining whether something's polemic or not is, is a very subjective exercise. Well, everybody acknowledges there is not an overt polemic. Um, it's implicit. But um, I think we could take any equation also consider the fact that monotheism is one of the themes of Genesis 1 that uh, could be considered uh, polemic. Well, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm not saying... I, but see, if God is talking to Adam and he says, I did it, yeah. then um, where's the polemic? Yeah. It becomes polemic when people said, well, actually, there are multiple gods and Marduk had a big part in it. That's when it becomes polemic. But the polemic actually is because these other people claim something that didn't happen happened rather than because the Genesis story started out that way. And I, I, it's one of the reasons I want to be careful about just, oh yeah, there's a, of course it's polemic. It's all implicit and it's all, it's all explainable on other bases. And I think that that story, frankly, is one of the three authoritative things we have. The Genesis 1 creation story came from the mouth of God. The Ten Commandments came from the mouth of God and then were written. And finally, we have the life of Jesus. And that's our windows into God's actual words himself. Everything else is at least mediated. And, uh, um, uh, you know, Moses said, well, this is what God told me. You hope he has it right. And then he writes it down. Um, but God spoke some things with his own word and people heard him and uh, he's, uh, lots of people heard him and heard the same thing. Um, and wrote some things with his own finger. And the Ten Commandments are one of the two things that he wrote with his own finger. The other one is the sins of some Pharisees, and they have disappeared with time, deliberately, I think. You write them in the sand so that the next people that step over it, it won't make a permanent record. Just, I know what you've been doing, that's all. But outside of that, there's nothing else that God actually wrote. And I think that this is something that God either spoke to Adam or possibly wrote himself, depending on whether Adam had to use writing or not. 
Um, one last comment, and then I think we'll. I've I've heard people say that that Genesis one was polemic, and I was always puzzled. Why was it necessary for them to evoke that designation, as if somehow it absolves them from considering it as having any merit? Uh, it strikes me as being a, a strange phenomenon in that, that I've observed in other settings too. If we come up with a term about something, we think that we have explained it away. Uh, even well, if the term was correct, it doesn't explain it away at all. It, it, it merely puts a label on it. That's all. So what is what do people usually expect to gain by calling it polemic? I think that there are two things that people expect to gain. Number one, they expect to be able to explain why things are phrased strangely. The greater light, the lesser light, why don't you just say the sun and the moon? Um, You know, sun is an English word that actually has been used as a deity. Sunday is the sun's day. Moon day is the moon's day. Tuesday is the day of two. Woden's day is the day of Woden. Thor's day is the day of Thor. Frigga's day is the day of Frigga. And Saturn's day is the day of Saturn. Yeah, in English. And if you do it in Spanish, it's martes, and miércoles, as in Mercury, and jueves, as in Jove or Jupiter, and uh, viernes, as in Venus's day. So that it was all days of gods. Which, interestingly, the uh, Hebrews avoided. They just said it's the first day, the second day of the week. Um, and uh, so these things have all been elevated to godhood. Um, and if you start saying first day, you're implicitly fighting against them now. But the point of it is, perhaps way back when, it wasn't fighting against them. It was understood as a simple description. And then when people start making names and, and, and worshiping these things, then the fact that you're not using the name, the fact that you continue to use the you know, old designations, the greater light, the lesser light, now becomes polemic even though it wasn't then. It's very much like um, the um, uh, friends, better known as the Quakers, who continued to use thee and thou in their speech for a long time. And the reason why is because you was the royal plural. So you wanted to impress somebody or you wanted to s acknowledge their status. You said you. For everyday common conversation, you use thee and thou. Very much like uh, do is still used in um, uh, in German. Uh, and, it, and it's very interesting because you have the same thing happening in German. Sets in Z, the Z is actually a, a if I understand it, it's identical to the, the word for they. So you've not only pluralized it, but you've impersonalized it. Uh, in Spanish, uh, what happens is, is it goes from uh, it goes from uh, uh, to to usted, which is a transformation from the second person to the third person. You know, oh, he is doing this. It's just very polite. So if you're if you're being formal in Spanish, 
you talk about to somebody else as if kind of as if they weren't there. And it's gotten to the point where you know you don't even bother putting the ending on. Uh, now, if you if I want to ask somebody, you know, uh, uh, does it hurt you? Le uh, duele, which is does it hurt him or does it hurt her? Uh, even though, obviously, I'm talking to you. No, I want to know whether you hurt. And the Quakers kept that speech pattern for a long, long time. They finally dropped it because it, the society has gone on and it's, you know, it's very much like now we talk about the sun and none of us particularly worship it. Um, uh, so that's the kind of thing that you can see in, in the choice of words turning into a polemic, sometimes quite accidentally. But that's why, uh, why I say I think we need to be careful about how we assume that it's a polemic. The other, the other thing that polemics are used for is to say, see, this is fighting um, a particular time period of Mesopotamian history, let's say. And therefore, it must have been written during that time period. And the crazy part of it is that it turns out that if you're going to use that rule, the time period happens to be earlier than what it's usually thought of as being. But uh, at one time, it was thought to be an evidence for late composition. It's now pretty well known that it's, be it's better argued that it's an early composition if you're going to use that rule. So uh, and that's one of the reasons I want to be careful about using polemic as an argument, because I think it's a weak one. Anyway, next week we'll look at the New Testament and creation. I think that'll be a lot more of a slam dunk than the Old Testament. <laughs>